Nigeria's central bank has so far ruled out the option of floating the Naira to protect its foreign currency reserves. Now the bank has put a cap to access to foreign currency, risking adverse investor perception and a hurt on domestic business operations. We look at which way forward for the Naira. Welcome to Global Biz Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Well, there are concerns of, of a possible Burundi's economic meltdown. We'll analyze the results for you on this program, but also coming up. Burundi is facing sanctions from the European Union over continued unrest. And the Muslim month of Ramadan brings good tidings for mango farmers in Mali. Nigeria's central bank has curbed access to the interbank currency market for the purchase of foreign currency bonds as well as a range of goods. Now the move is aimed at tightening liquidity as well as conserving foreign exchange reserves. Nigeria's central bank has spent in excess of $3.4 billion to support the Naira since it fixed exchange rates in February. The bank said importers could no longer get hard currency from the interbank market to buy items such as rice, cement, private jets and other construction materials. Analysts say the latest measures risk diverting dollar demand to the black market, worsening perceptions about economic policy and delaying a decision to devalue the Naira. The Naira sold for 220 against the dollar at the black market. It was trading at 198.50 on the interbank market in the commercial capital Lagos on Wednesday. Well, the announcement by the central bank came a day after President Muhammadu Buhari vowed to recover billions of dollars allegedly stolen by officials and restore financial sanity. While the president accused previous regimes of throwing the rule books to the dogs, President Buhari's strong words came after a meeting with the governors of Nigeria states in which they said they were $658 billion dollars billion naira just about 3.3 billion dollars in debt and needed federal government support to offset a funding crisis zamfara state governor abdulaziz yari abubeka said the governors had suggested three ways out the government could refund the money spent on federal projects such as roads banks and extend existing loans to up to 20 years or the government could share out all revenues usually saved in the so-called excess crude account The European Union has warned of possible economic sanctions on Burundi as protests continue over the president's plan to run for a third term. The threat follows a grenade attack which killed four people in Ngozi City Bar. There has been ongoing political violence since President Pierre Nkurunzinza announced plans to run for another five years in the upcoming elections. Opponents in the country say the bid is unconstitutional. The European Union funds about half the annual budget of Burundi, one of the world's poorest nations. The country is still recovering from an ethnically fueled civil war in 2005, and there are fears the violence could intensify in the lead up to the election. Now, as political tensions continue to simmer in Burundi, analysts warn that the country could face an economic meltdown. Here's Noel Makugu with that report. Pierre Nkurunziza's opponents say his bid for another five years in office is unconstitutional, but he cites a court ruling that found he could run. This political stalemate is now hurting the economy. In the restive neighborhood of Sibitoke, student Eric Nsabimana sells fast-moving consumer goods. He, like other traders, has struggled to make any sales since the protests began. I'm not making any money. I hardly make enough money to eat. I used to sell cases of beer, but now I'm lucky if I sell even one. It's over and there are no customers. In many parts of the capital, Bujumbura, businesses have been paralyzed almost daily by demonstrations and violent clashes between protesters and police. When you see markets burned down and when you see students out of school and other state institutions that usually contribute to the economy not working, it clearly shows that the economy is not functioning. The few traders that still come to do business every day say customers have deserted the markets. My sales have decreased. These days we bring our products to sell here, but we don't get anything. People are not buying. They just pass because they have no money. We come and showcase our products, and then we go back home without selling anything. Analysts now argue the consequences of the months of political unrest could have long-term and far-reaching effects on the country's already weak economy. Burundi, one of the poorest countries in the world, was crippled by a 13-year civil war from which 
it has never fully recovered. Today, Burundi has an annual gross national income per capita of just $260 and heavily relies on imports and aid money. Some sectors are worse off than others, for example in the hotel industry. Now, if you break it down and look at state revenues, they essentially come from foodstuff, fuel, telecommunication, as well as the brewery, Brarudi products. And if those sectors are touched, then it's going to affect Burundi's exports as well as local business, and I think that will also have dire consequences for our economy. Burundi is due to hold parliamentary elections in June 29th and presidential elections in July 15th. Rights groups have placed the death toll since the protest erupted late in April at 70. However, the government says not more than 40 people have died. No Makuru CCTV. Well, Burundi has been in political crisis for the past two months now. Katie Gregory is joining me from London to discuss this issue further. Katie, what form could these sanctions though take? Yes, well, from what the EU has hinted at, they would take the form of individual sanctions. So basically targeting those specifically who are taking part in this recent surge of violence, inciting this violence. That could mean uh, perhaps some of Nkurunziza's security services, police commanders, not so much military, but anyone really associated with the government-linked militias. Uh, anyone stopping a free election and free press in the country as well. Uh, what this would entail, we can't really be sure whether they'd be banned from travelling, foreign assets, seized who really knows at this point the problem being with this sort of thing is is getting the right information on who to target I know with UN sanctions similar to this the level of evidence they need is really high it's not that straightforward and it's not always easy to get the right people on the list so you, you really need to be connected to the system to get the right people and with not long left until these elections that could be really hard you would think well, there's been debate about sanctions, though, Katie, that it, it does also affect the population. So how could the measures, though, target those committing the violence while not adversely affecting the whole population? Well, that's the hard thing, really. Even if you're targeting individuals like the EU would, any sanctions do have the potential to have a broader effect. This is something the EU would most certainly be trying to steer clear of. We do know that Nkurunziza is determined to win this third term. It may just mean those who have these sanctions imposed on them just dig their heels in even further, creating a sense of, well, you know, what have we got to lose? And then not care about using more violent tactics. Uh, the EU is certainly in a hard place. Uh, a lot of the post-war progress is being compromised at the moment. So the EU needs to be seen to be reacting to this recent violence. But the last thing it would want is to put more pressure on the population of Burundi at the moment. Well, Katie, we've already seen, though, in the past, Belgium and the Netherlands suspending some um, aid flows there. The U.S. has also warned of sanctions. What does the increased political instability, though, mean for the future of Burundi? Yes, everyone I've spoken to seems to think that... that countries would, foreign countries would start to be pulling a bit of foreign aid back if this political instability was to continue post-election. There would definitely be efforts to stem this foreign aid. Burundi is unfortunately the orphan of the region. There's really no foreign investment aside from the aid the country is receiving. Uh, as you mentioned, Belgium and the Netherlands have already cut some aid flows. That was back in May and mainly related to supporting these current elections. Uh, the US, as you said, has also said they'd consider some form of sanctions. They've definitely threatened. One of the real sticking points here could be that Burundi has been a really good partner in the ongoing fight against al-Shabaab in Somalia. So the US and the UK in particular would want to keep that going, you would think. Would Burundi continue to provide troops if foreign aid was cut? Well, that remains to be seen, really. All right, uh, Katie Gregory joining us there in London. Thank you for that update. Well, let's return briefly now to Nigeria, where, as we mentioned earlier, Nigeria's central bank has curbed access to interbank currency markets for the purchase of foreign currency bonds, as well as a range of goods. Now, Deji Batmos has been following those events from Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. Deji, the central bank was expected, though, to address the press on Wednesday over the new measures to support the Naira. What reasoning was given to support the new rules? Well, basically, what the central bank said was that it took the decision uh, basically to conserve foreign reserve. As you know, the foreign reserve has been seriously depleted. As we speak today, the foreign reserve is around $29 billion. And there's a limit to which um, you can allow foreign reserve to, to, to go low. And so the federal, gov um, 
the central bank actually saying it wants to conserve, um, conserve um, the, the foreign reserve and that it also wants to restore stability to the foreign exchange market. And uh, basically those are the reasons. And uh, that's the reason why it has uh, itemized those um, you know, goods now that, uh, uh, that have been excluded from uh, the access in the foreign exchange market. Oh, well, there's need there to restore stability in the foreign exchange market, though, Deji. But there are reports the pent-up demand for dollars in Nigeria is in excess of $4 billion. Yet the central bank ruled out the option of a free float regime. How has it been received, though, by dealers? Well, the dealers are not happy with what the central bank uh, has done. Of course, the dealers would want, uh, as you said, a free float regime. And um, because what the central bank, the rules that the central bank uh, has actually introduced has caused a problem of liquidity in the interbank market. You don't have much supply of dollar. And then the, the, the dealers are obviously not happy. They say it's, it's affecting uh, foreign investors and that foreign investors may not be interested in buying Nigerian bonds and investing in a... Uh, the Nigerian uh, stock exchange and they've also come out to say it's going to cause a serious problem now for local uh, industrialists who would find it difficult now to get dollars to buy to transact I mean to, to import their goods abroad so obviously they are complaining uh, but then the central bank has said look it is doing this to prevent um, a, a complete depreciation of uh, uh, the, the Naira all right, uh, Deji Biden was there for us in Lagos. Uh, thank you. Now, turning our attention to the markets. A positive corporate news helped Egypt's stock market rebound in early trade Wednesday after three days of falls. The main Cairo stock index closed the day 0.14% stronger as Kalar Holdings gained 1% after saying it had signed agreements with Financial Holdings International to sell its stakes in several non-core units. And we still have more. We still have more for you here on the program. Why Nairobi is a hot spot for malls in the region. And former rivals in the Central African Republic find unity in fishing. Africa is on the move. It's 77 of the world's 10 fastest growing economy. We help you make sense of the fast changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is happening. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. South Africa's ailing gold mining sector is holding its breath with tense wage negotiations now underway. The unions are demanding pay increases of up to 80% from mining companies, which are already suffering due to a fall in mineral prices and the ongoing power shortages. Angelo Coppola brings us the latest from the capital, Johannesburg. The first round of talks wasn't going to yield any agreement, sources tell us. Monday saw the unions presenting their positions and the Chamber of Mines was due to present its various financial models on Tuesday. And then the talks were postponed early on Wednesday afternoon to reconvene on Monday next week. A source inside the negotiations says the sense is that talks will move quickly along. There's a new dynamic because the National Union of Mine Workers is a new chief negotiator and AMCU is now also involved in the mix. AMCU has indicated up front that if they don't see movement in the next week or during the third round, they will declare a dispute. It's also believed that the Chamber of Mines may move away from tradition and come in with a higher than expected opening offer. This is to speed the process along, it says. It appears that everyone wants a quick resolution, either in a dispute being declared or a settlement being reached. In the meantime, the deadline for the old wage deal comes to an end on the 30th of June. For CCTV in Johannesburg, I'm Angelo Coppola. Zimbabwe's government has been hoping its mining sector can turn around the ailing national economy. But so far, the industry has failed to deliver weighed down by a myriad of problems. CCTV's Farayam Wakutuya takes a look at what the government's doing to try and reinvigorate the sector. With capacity to meet 30% of the world's diamond supply, Zimbabwe is poised to be among the industry's big boys. Well, they may not be bright and shiny now, but these are diamonds, believe it or not. There are over 460,000 carats of them here, categorized by producer, quality, and size. 
It's all part of a very meticulous system that has been custom built to allow Zimbabwe to hold diamond tenders. This is the seventh time dealers have converged here following the lifting of a KP ban. 1.4 million carats have been sold, raking in $75 million. But that's below expectations. Exports have dropped 34% compared to last year as production continues to recede. It's a phenomenon that's affected all the major resources, including gold, platinum and chrome. Only nickel, experiencing a resurgence, has been spared. Erratic power supplies, high royalties and contentious indigenization laws that require foreign investors to allocate 51% of their shareholding to the state, even for unexploited resources, are the main reasons for the lackluster showing. The mining company starts off already lacking 51% of the capital needed to develop the mine. They've got to provide all that capital, but they told at the very beginning, you're not allowed to earn any income from 51% of the capital you invest. And in the end, the mining company would have to say, we are having to pay an effective tax rate of 85%, or 90% if you throw in the municipal levies and charges, and we can't do that, so we're not coming. So we will not start any new mines with the regulations we have in place at the moment. Government has been calling for local value addition, going as far as issuing an ultimatum to platinum miners to build a refinery or ship out. Negotiations continue. I and the minister um, met with um, Unki uh, in South Africa during the state visit, their leadership there. We have had occasion to meet with Mimosa's shareholders because I said, let me speak to the shareholders. Um, and uh, they have assured us that they would present to us a credible plan of meeting our requirements. Analysts argue that building a refinery with the current output could prove more costly than maintaining the status quo where platinum ore is refined in South Africa. They're charging us about 10%. 10% of a billion dollars is $100 million. $100 million is all that we would save if we built a refinery. But if the refinery costs $5 billion, the $100 million that we're saving would take 50 years to pay for the refinery. Government is being urged to carefully analyze the costs and benefits of various strategies as it strives to maximize the returns from the crucial extractive sector. Farai Makutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. In apparent defiance of terror threats, Kenya's capital Nairobi is witnessing an unprecedented boom in shopping malls. Buoyed by a growing middle class and infrastructure improvements, developers have spared no effort dotting the city with malls. CCTV's Clementine Logan tells us more. Kenya is in the grips of mall mania. The country's expanding consumer class and improved infrastructure has made it East Africa's hottest destination for developers and retailers. The newest to open its doors is Garden City. Over time, over the next three to four years, we'll build out the entire mixed-use development in its entirety. And that will have, you know, 500,000 square foot uh, retail mall. We'll have close to 30, 300,000 square feet of offices and about 400 homes. One local journalist has even coined the term malliosis to describe middle-class Kenyans' newfound attraction to shopping malls. For consumers, it's all about having a wider choice. It's giving people more variety, more options. It's opening people up to you know, a whole new world of shopping. Uh, when you look at the space, the parking, and uh, the accessories inside here, you can't find it elsewhere. Now, big name international brands are giving their local competitors a run for their money. But some who've studied consumer habits here say they welcome competition. The formal sector is growing slowly and once everybody comes in and brings uh, excitement in different ways and different means, it will increase the formal capacity, which is good for everybody, good for employment, good for taxations, good for the government, good for everybody else. It's not difficult to understand why retailers are scrambling to set up shop in Nairobi. 
Kenya has been ranked Africa's second biggest formalized retail economy after South Africa. But analysts warn there's still work to be done before Kenya's retail sector can realize its full potential. It's no use having retailers if when you go to the shelf, the goods are not able to come there. So we need to really help our manufacturing industries um, and also our agribusiness be able to supply and have a smooth supply chain to the shelf. The other area that could be a bottleneck if we don't work on it is land. Nevertheless, developers behind the 20-acre hub say their timing is spot on. If you look at the number of malls that are coming onto the market at one time, yes, it is quite a lot. But what that means is organisations such as Carrefour can open in more than one centre at once. Arguably, this is a unique time in Nairobi's history. It will probably never be repeated again. Garden City has just opened its doors. It's fully leased and analysts say that demand for retail space is robust. So there's a lot of confidence that other shopping centres like this Two Rivers Mega Mall will fill up very quickly. Due to open its doors in December, Centum's 100-acre Two Rivers mixed-use development will boast the biggest mall in eastern and central Africa, employing some 2,500 people. We thought Nairobi lacked grade A assets, which would attract international retailers. We had to go out and bring the international retailers in who actually validated our assumptions and show Nairobi is the retail, it's the prime retail space to expand to. For some, Nairobi's mall boom means more choice and variety. For others, the hope is it will translate into further growth and employment opportunities. Clementine Logan, CCTV, Nairobi, Kenya. Now, members of former warring factions in the Central African Republic have put aside their ideological differences and teamed up to develop a small-scale fishing business in a sign of hope for the country's future. The men have formed a cooperative that has seen former combatants put aside their differences, combine efforts and engage in commercially productive activities like fishing. Cruising the murky waters of the Lagoon River in the Central African Republic. Believe it or not, these men have not been friends. They are former arch enemies, members of the Zeleka and anti Balaka militias. And just over a year ago, they might well have been involved in combat against one another. But right now, their focus is on the task at hand to net fish. When we get fish, we sell them and use the money for the group. The country has seen violent clashes since March 2013 when the predominantly Muslim Seleka rebels seized power in the country. That led to the emergence of Christian militias that attacked Muslim enclaves in the capital, Bangui, and across the country in a wave of violence focused on destroying businesses, homes and mosques of the largely wealthier Muslim community. A peace deal in May 2015 has led to a reconciliation process under the stewardship of interim president Catherine Samba Panza. And the focus on group activities by these men is a sign that in some communities at least, that process may be beginning to bear fruit. We use large nets that we make on our own. We leave together at night until dawn in the hope of catching more fish for our group. We have since worked together. The group has not only drawn attention to the potential for reconciliation, it has also elicited support from the community. Sometimes when we come, we bring them hooks and nets. We also give them sugar and coffee so that they are strong enough to bring fish for us to sell. Full disarmament of militias may still be a long way off, but this group of fishermen is offering the Central African Republic a ray of hope. Maria Galang, CCTV. A look at commodity prices now and oil held above $64 a barrel on Wednesday before a U.S. government report expected to show domestic crude in inventories fell for an eighth week. This could mean that a supply glut is easing and doubts over the likelihood of a deal next week on Iran's new work also supported. While well, the Muslim month of Ramadan proves quite the boon for Mali mangoes.
Mali's mango harvest is in full swing and there's no time to waste with the fruit in high demand during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. While local demand for the fruit is strong, the vast majority of mangoes are now being sold to the growing European and Middle Eastern export markets. These workers are bringing in this year's mango crop on a farm in the suburbs of the Malian capital of Bamako. In the predominantly Islamic nation, many of these mangoes will end up with Muslim families as a treat after Ramadan dawn to dusk fasting. Mango production is a major earner for the nation's agricultural industry, with more than a million square kilometres of land in Mali used to grow the crop. The mango harvest around Bamako alone is about 800 tons, worth more than 1.7 million US dollars. On top of that, the Kulikoro area has brought to market more than 3.5 million US dollars worth, 200,000 tons of mangoes. The industry is critical to a nation still recovering from a recession triggered by political unrest in 2012. More than half of all production goes for export, mostly to the Middle East and Europe, contributing more than $25 million to the national economy. Packers and exporters must ensure the fruit is of high quality. This packing facility has a capacity of 3,500 tons of mangoes a year since the mango harvest runs from the end of April, start of May, until mid-July. Our export capacity depends on the mango harvest and the rainy season. We usually ship three or four containers per day. The other year we moved 75 containers during the season, but that total goes up and down due to factors outside of our control. There has been significant industry growth in recent years, with now more than 100 companies working in the mango export sector. All farms are Global Gap, Fair Trade, and BioCertified, so we are a big business. Beyond that, we export to Dubai, Morocco, France, Germany, Belgium, and last year we exported more than 1,200 tons. This year, our target is to export 1,500 tons. So as these mangoes are packed and ready for export, it's hoped the industry will continue to grow, stimulating the economy and increasing local employment opportunities. Andrew Thompson, CCTV. And as far as the currencies go, the Kenyan shilling gained ground on Wednesday, helped by commercial banks trimming their long dollar positions. At the close of trade, commercial banks quoted the shilling at 98.35, 98.45 to the dollar, compared with Tuesday's close of 98.80, 98.90. Well, that's it for Global Business Africa today, but we'll continue with the program tomorrow. Here's what we are working on. The mining on a top Africa conference opens in London. We keep an eye on what emerges from that. We'll also be looking at Malawi's first ever investment forum that aims to generate about $16 billion in potential investments. And that's it for this edition of Global Biz Africa. Remember, you can send your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. You can book our Facebook, you can visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa. You can also stay in touch with Global Business on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Goodbye.